Here we are yet again. It's science time. Woo woo. Are you here with us right now? We're going to talk about science. This is This Week in Science. And it's time for our podcast that we do in this here place. We're going to record the show. Snap, snap. Are we ready? I'm ready. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> we are live. I'm glad I have co host buy in. This is good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're excited. Blair is here. This I'm is here. good. We're excited. Justin I'm, is I'm here. not where I was, but I'm still here. Yes. With us. I'm excited. Yeah. There we go. Oh, I heard myself for a second because Justin took off his headphones. <gasps> okay. Let's do this. Let's do this. Hello, everyone in the chat rooms. Hello, chat. Let's make this a thing. It's a real thing. In three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 810, recorded on Wednesday, February 3rd, 2021. Humans are all thumbs. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with blackmail, symbols, and monkey talk. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! What could be greater than knowing that you are alive? Ah, life. That great thing that we are all experiencing right now. And what would be even better is to do something that you love with the rest of your life. Since we don't all want to be doctors or science news communicators or succulent farmers, we might need to figure out some other things that people can do. One great place to look for things to do is science. In science, there's a lot that needs to be studied. In fact, uh, everything needs another looking at at some point. There's pretty much no limit to what you could decide to study when it comes to science, because everything's on the table. To get a good idea of what's available, what you could study in science, we've put together this quick list of examples we call This Week in Science, coming up next. kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week there's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek I want to know what's happening to you kiki and blair oh and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we are here in the beginning of february ready to talk about science doesn't feel like Groundhog's Day to me. Nope, no siree, Bob. We've got new science, new stories, and new excitement, curiosity, and fun. I have a bunch of stories about thumbs, wind, and feelings. Mm. Yes. What do you have, Justin? I've got Martian mud pies. Uh, earliest symbolic writing ever, maybe? Good. Freshwater oceans of the recent past. And let me hear your monkey talk. <laughs> let me hear your monkey talk. Your monkey talk. All right. I want to hear it. I want to hear it later. Blair, what's in the animal corner? I have singing crickets. I have blackmail. And I have um, the moon. Ooh. Oh, you brought I us like the, the moon? moon. Mm -hmm. I like the moon. Take a bite out of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you take a bite out of crime. Oh. You you lasso the moon. Lasso the moon. There we go. Yes. Yeah. Bring it down to earth. Apple, unless it's now we're getting into right the, apple. Now we're getting into idioms and metaphors and fables and <laughs> Okay. Back to the science. As we jump into the show, everyone, if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, on Twitch. Look for This Week in Science. You can also find us all places that podcasts are found. 
pretty much, I think. And you can find us at our website, twist.org. Ready for the science? Yeah. Yeah, let's do this. I've got a fable, an old story, Tom Thumb. Well, not really Tom Thumb. I have a story about humans' old thumbs. Turns out the human thumb goes back about two million years, according to a new analysis of thumb bones and yeah. physiology, but n- not just the bones, because that's the way that everyone's looked at them before. They've well, looked at that's what you can see. That's it's what's what left. you can. Right. It's exactly (laughs) soft tissues are not fossilized very easily. And so if we're going back in history to look at the leftover bones of our ancestors, you're not looking at, you know, the the fatty or the the the, not fatty, the the bulky, strong, fleshy thumb muscles (laughs) that are involved. No, no, no. You're not looking at those. You instead are just looking at the bones. You're looking at what is there and making inferences based on the proportions that the bones are sitting there in. So how long is the bone? How short is it? How do the joints look like they potentially interdigitate? What do we know about living examples of a particular species? So say humans or chimpanzees versus what can we kind of make up about these previous ancestors and their bones? Well, these researchers publishing in Current Biology on the biomechanics of the human thumb and the evolution of dexterity, they, uh, they based on their new analysis, which is a, a tool that they have come up with that could potentially help analyses of all sorts of different interdigitations and dex- dexterity analyses moving forward, um, they have taken in taken soft tissue into account for the first time. They have looked at a very specific muscle in the thumb, and it's called the musculus opponens pollicis. And this particular muscle, we know it's in humans. And uh, let me see, I think I think I, yeah, Justin's holding his thumb up to I, this the screen. This is an example in yes, case anyone doesn't case, have one of these at home. In case you want to know where your thumb muscle is, let me, uh, I'm going to put a video on the screen for those of you who are here in the room with us right now as Justin's holding up his thumb to share. <laughs> so this muscle is, if you if you look at your thumb, it is is from the base of the lowest joint of your thumb down toward the wrist bone. And the muscle connects. It's the one of the fattier muscles that's right in in the joint. And it it allows the pulling of the thumb into the rest of the hand so that you can touch your thumb to your fingertips. The contraction of that muscle can let you touch your pinky for example, with the tip of your thumb. And so and this, this is this is this one, one of the muscles that swelled up when I got attacked by the Martin up to like <sighs> the size of a grapefruit was right here. <laughs> it's probably very sore too. And yeah. your dexterity was probably reduced as a result. Yep. I still drop things constantly yeah, because right. of that. Mm-hmm. So this muscle so I'm is guessing it got bigger, bigger in human. Yes, it got bigger. It got bigger. Bigger, yes, it is bigger in humans than it is in chimpanzees. And the researchers compared these existing examples, so chimpanzees to humans, but they also looked at all sorts of other examples of fossilized hominin specimens, also looking and comparing against author, uh, arthropo. <laughs> Australopithecus? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Australopith- Australopithecus, yes. Now, Australopithecus, they have determined, did not have as developed a muscle, this particular muscle, as the hominin, other hominin specimens. And they have particular 
fossils from South Africa that they date back to two million years old that they think are the earliest example of the development of this muscle. And they believe that the thumb and that muscle are part of what make makes human make humans human. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so this is fitting the classification that they already had also, right? So yes. this is already, they already decided this is when the homo genus started. Yeah. And so mm. this is, this is an interesting thing that their classification of these muscles also fits in this same neat category. The other thing, though, is well, tool tool use, because yeah. Australopithecus this... were tool users and creators, but the the researchers say that maybe they were just a bit clumsier. <laughs> so yeah, I mean this is the 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 eventual uh transfer into tool reliant use. I talked about this on the show before. Yeah. That's when they started you start using those hands a lot more and and once you really are carrying these things around, you're not going to use your hands for locomotion. Because you got to carry right. stuff with them. So you got to stay bipedal to carry these things. And then if you're yep. holding on to stuff, it's hard to climb trees because you, you really got, you made this amazing, cool thing. You're not going to put it down. So you just carry it everywhere. You hold on to it even when you sleep, probably. So yeah, our whole evolution was uh, largely based on our, our uh, adaptation of stone tools. Absolutely. And it's just a it's really interesting that they are pinpointing it to this particular muscle and the mm -hmm. evolution of our dexterity and our hands. Um, but researchers do criticize that there are probably up there are nine muscles or nine more muscles that are involved in these kinds of dexterous hand movements. And so what about all those other muscles? Just to look at one isn't really enough. So that they're recommending that more of these analyses are done on more muscles. Yeah, but I mean, they're also not going to, if they're at all interested in this field, they're not going to say like, ah, that's it. No more studies. We've seen enough. But that's it. it. We're done. It, like, like, yeah. No more. That's there's it. Always, we know everything. There's always a need it's for done. more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there is also, but there's all sorts of stuff that you can look at too, and in, in like the length of the toe bones and the arches and the legs and the bends in the leg. It's like there's all of these things are fitting together yep. uh, in telling the story of human evolution. Yeah. Anyway, it's a it's a cool story. It takes us back two million years to the beginning of the Homo lineage. Mm -hmm. But let's move on from this into outer space. Justin, what kind of drama oh. is happening on Mars? Do I have outer space stories? I didn't know that I... Oh, I do! Yeah. Um, so they've got sinkholes. <laughs> sinkholes and... Uh, Watch out where you buy property on Mars. <laughs> yeah, sinkholes and landslides uh, on the surface of Mars. And not a whole lot of great explanation for them i guess there's been some different theories of maybe this was at one time they were thinking oh this was potential evidence for water moving uh underground but uh this is research was led by the city institute senior research scientist janice bishop came up with a hypothesis about what is causing all of this activity on mars the team believes that thin layers of ice are melting uh, from interactions between underground water ice and also chlorine salts and some sulfates, which have been creating this strange liquid-like slush moving around. Uh, and as it moves from one place to the other, it's creating sinkholes, ground claps, and like different things where we can see uh, uh, landslides or, or stuff kind of getting upheaved a little bit. Uh, one of the things is they'd noticed this previously that there was when on the sun like these things would appear on sun side of, the, of of mountains and ridgeways and stuff. So this is a what is it? a bishop again? I'm excited about the prospect of micro scale liquid water on Mars in near surface environments where ice and salts are present. This could revolutionize our perspective on habib habibidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidabidab
Habitability? Habitability. Habit- 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 yeah, you can't say it. It's a hard word. Habitability. 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 Uh, Just below the surface on Mars. (laughs) We're having trouble with all the words and stuff today. Um, (laughs) It's not good for people who speak in a podcast. Yeah, so so my words together. (laughs) So some of this, some of this comes from uh, previous surveys where they can tell that there's these sulfate uh, uh, conditions. And where this is taking place, they believe this is where the ice is, the, the ice is involved because it's not till it sort of gets heated up by the sun that this effect takes place. My favorite part of this study is that they re, they went and recreated all of these in the lab, which is basically a big bucket of dirt that they put ice at the bottom of and froze, like really froze because uh, Mars is cold. I don't know if you've noticed but it, it's it's uh, like it gets down to negative sixty uh, degrees Celsius. It's frozen. So they so they, yeah. So they tried to say what happens if you froze and thawed Mars like soil uh, comprised of chlorine salts and sulfates at low temperatures, such as would be found on Mars. And they got the result of a slice, slushy ice formation near fifty degrees Celsius, followed by a gradual melting of the ice once it got to negative 40 degrees Celsius, which if you're not familiar with Celsius, negative 40 Celsius is exactly the same as negative 40 Fahrenheit. So it doesn't matter which which one you have there. It's cold. It's, it's frozen. It's really cold. But they, <laughs> they could tell like at that sort of heating up, which is about what happens when the sun hits uh, uh, an ex- the open surface of, of Mars. And would warm it up. Yeah. And would warm it up to about that. Yeah. So, and they kind of could, and then they were seeing these effects in their giant mud pies that they had frozen <laughs> to these extreme temperatures. Yeah. And they got, actually, it was a pretty rapid reaction. So, and also this is, I guess there's some correlations to this that happen elsewhere. Uh, one of the researchers had been working, Oh, where is it? Somewhere in South America at these the dry valleys, these sediments mm-hmm. in these dry valleys where they also have these salt conditions. And they also have these uh, these sort of strange implosions and underground slushy things that take place from. Uh, yeah, I, th- I, I know that, that, we've, the, that scientists have kind of gone back and forth about the, these features on the surface and at. A long time ago, they were saying, oh, these are like mudslides. And then they were going, well, how do they get there? And then they're like, oh, these are these are little rivers and streams. And and they were thinking that it might be evidence of actual liquid water on the surface. And then they're like, oh, no, yeah. never mind. Let's walk back from that again. And so now they're coming back with this new evidence that it indeed might be this frozen thawing yeah. ground and and. The slipping Which they had, of they it. They kind of thought yeah. before, but it was sort of like Mars would get like they thought this frost layer over it mm-hmm. overnight when we couldn't see it, and then, and then the sun would hit it and it would melt so fast, but that would be enough to create the some of these effects. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it looks like the ice it's underneath thin layers near the surface uh, that that mixed with the salt is creating this these strange highways of fluidity underneath the soil. Very cool. Fluidly, let us move from Mars to the moon. Blair. Very nice. Like the tides go in and out. Let us discuss the full moon and how it makes people crazy. <laughs> but it, it doesn't. Does it? Does well, it? so I, I brought this mainly because of the very interesting conversation we had last week. So if you haven't heard last week's podcast, now is the plug to go back and listen. Uh, Kiki brought a really interesting story about it was it was just it was the smallest sample size perhaps I've ever heard on the show. But it was about women's um, menstrual cycles being affected by the moon, which I took a lot of issues with. But ultimately it kind of brought this whole conversation about about how humans are impacted by sol- by lunar cycles. And we do know that there is a weird anecdotal thing if you ask anyone who works in an ER, chances are they'll say, "Oh yeah, full moons all sorts of wackos end up in the ER on the full moon." So what actually is happening there? And this is 
maybe a glimpse at a piece of it. So this is from University of Washington, the National University of, of Quilmes in Argentina and Yale University. And they were looking at sleep cycles in people and how they oscillate during the 29.5 day lunar cycle. So they looked at these indigenous communities in Northern Argentina with little or no electricity. They also looked at college students in Seattle. So they kind of took the electricity thing out of the equation. They removed that variable by checking all of these things against each other. And they were consistent. And they saw that there are oscillations of an individual's um, sleep cycle, regardless of access to electricity. Um, the variations are less pronounced in urban environments, but they're still there. This is um, essentially they sleep less uh, and they go to sleep later, closer and closer to the full moon. Depending on the community, the total amount of sleep varied about 46 to 58 minutes, about exactly 46 to 58 minutes. Bedtime seesawed by around 30 minutes and they had the latest bedtimes and the shortest amount of sleep three to five days leading up to the full moon. So there, there's some stuff going on here. Most likely it is just like we have our own circadian rhythms in inside our body, there could be lunar phase rhythms in our body related to the fact that near a full moon, it is brightest. So there, you can do stuff at night that you couldn't do in other phases of the lunar cycle. So there, there are advantages, especially if you're a, a gatherer or if you're a hunter, if you're just trying to gather food of any sort, there is a certain subset of resources that you could get access to in the dusk and then early evening that you could not get if the moon was not out in a pre-electricity world. Right. Not to mention being able to catch all those crepuscular animals. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Plus the, plus the moon is so loud. <laughs> so it much. Is. It's so noisy. It makes my ears ring whenever it's a full moon. Just right? like everybody else. If, if it's not a, like if it's not a cloudy else. night. Like everybody experiences that, right? Yes. So well, what moon, I want to know. Like your ears start ringing. Like, yeah. So what I want to know is whether the cycle, whether that effect shifted when it was cloudy and there was no sign of mm, moonlight. Great question. Yes, that would be an excellent next research question. Their plans for their next research questions are to focus on how the the moon is impacting their sleep. So is that an innate circ circadian clock? Are there other signals that are affecting sleep that are related to the full moon? So, I mean, for example, um, there are a lot of animals that are louder on the full moon at night you hear mm -hmm. more sounds in general so uh, is there is there some weird thing that's just like the earth is active i need to be active <laughs> they're just you know I, it sounds like the light has a lot to do with it um i mean that's that would be my primary mm -hmm. hypothesis but then i i would agree but then we're it, talking about something that lived outdoors but we're talking about humans Right, and the and We're the like cave dwelling thing, and the difference here between college students in in Seattle and yeah. people living out in the country in South America, you know, mm -hmm. Argentina. That's <laughs> it's going to be very different uh, mm -hmm. living situations and factors. Um, yeah. The other the other possibility that was brought up in the study last week on menstrual cycles is that there's also potentially an impact of the gravitational effects of the moon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I think would be harder to to pr to prove. Yes, but definitely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, it's. I mean, so as opposed to the the situation with the menstrual cycle, which is it's about twenty eight days, and a lunar cycle is about twenty nine and a half days. So mm -hmm. also, just mm, maybe that's just it coincidence. <laughs> and over the time, same time? <laughs> yeah, and over time, you will overlap. Yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah, but but, uh, but this this is less easily explained away, I think. And, and yeah. it's just, it's an interesting question of, yes, we live inside. Yes, we have electricity. But that's only been for about 200 years. And 
uh, as we just discussed, uh, we've been humans or a hominid of some sort for about 2 million. So that's a lot of history of living yeah. with the moon that we could potentially be working with. It's very early for us to be ditching those evolutionary habits. So, And I do know that just anecdotally, I have to pull my shades down must pull the shades down when it's a full moon or, or around it because it's so bright to it sleep, is disorienting too bright yes. yeah and even if you're out and yeah. about there's you it, you feel it you're like it's is it nighttime it's too bright out here no it's because like, it's making oh. that it's making that sound it's making this it's <laughs> making that sound it's so, it's loud. so loud so it's like sound can hear light so i can, no i can I hear the moon i i mean this uh, <laughs> moon, moon, moon synesthesia <laughs> it's just like it's just like a uh like a really fast ringing bell you don't that's hear the tinnitus moon. <laughs> oh yeah well that's what it is it calls it, it yeah it causes the the tin, tinnitus so it kind of sounds like Justin needs to be the focus of a story coming up. But in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, let's talk about wind. I got some got some wind for you all. Wouldn't it be great if wind and solar could make up more of our sustainable energy supply? Yes. yes. Shouldn't. It would be great, right? But shouldn't yeah. we know where to put the windmills? Benicia. And <laughs> but Benicia isn't the only spot. But no, no, it's but Benicia can take care of a lot of it. They have exactly. trees that grow sideways there. So expand on that, Justin. What is the wind like in Benicia? It uh, goes in the same direction all the because all the trees that comes through that it's, it's strong. And, and it's strong. consistent. It's consistent and it's extreme. And from my sailor family, this one, Dad, I learned from you. It blows like snot. Anyway, the wind <laughs> is very extreme. And so you need to know the extent of the wind speed. How extreme is it going to get in any particular location? You have to know how big a windmill you can you can construct you have to know how strong that windmill needs to be you need to have all sorts of engineering factors taken into consideration and if you don't know the wind that you're going to be up against over the lifetime of a windmill you could be overstressing that windmill causing it to break too often it could lead to all sorts of unintended costs and or you're put, going to be putting something too big in a location where there's not much wind and you just need a lightweight windmill to get things going. So it's really good to have some kind of an atlas where wind speed is specifically mapped to location and publishing in Nature Energy, a bunch of wind energy scientists from Cornell University have released a new global wind atlas. Hmm. It's an atlas that's documents extreme wind speeds for the whole world lots of different locations so that it can people who want to build windmills and don't know where to put them they can look at the atlas and say hey that's a windy spot maybe we should think about that spot and it will direct people a lot better in their sustainability efforts that's kind very of cool. cool i also yeah. love the idea of saying hi nice to meet you what do you do for a living i'm a wind scientist Wind scientist. Oh my gosh, that's amazing! My I love science it. I'd love blows. To... Oh man! Don't don't Boy, get howdy. them started on turbulence, though. Oh, no, they no, won't, they no, will no, no. not be quiet again after that. So I have this, I have this thing stuck in my head forever. Uh, that there was, um, I think it was a high schooler who won some big prize in a science contest um, for submitting a design for a windmill that went over freeways. So it was one of those ones that shaped kind of like this with the blades. Mm -hmm. And it's because- shaped horizontally. Yeah, yeah and, and, uh, and because uh, freeways are consistent wind, right? It's, you know, there's the, the, it's always going in the same direction. 
um, because all the cars speeding by create this this wind. It yeah. it was this idea. It was exactly the same. It was, it was a consistent movement of wind at a fairly consistent speed. And if cars are going to be producing this turbulence and this mm-hmm. movement, then why not? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So according to the paper, uh, the total global wind turbine installed capacity is more than 651 gigawatts. Wind is now generating over 1,700 terawatt hours of electricity per year. This is only 7.5% of global supply. Uh, in addition, the United Wait, States... Wait, it's, it's got how much? 7.5% of the global supply. Wow, that's incredible. It that's is incredible, awesome. but we can do better. We can oh, do yeah. more. United States, our power is carried by 17%. It's 17% wind. Uh, installed capacity. Europe, 31%. China, 36%. Hmm. Yeah. The installed capacity for wind energy of the total. We're getting there, but we need to make more efforts like this to make it better and easier. All right, Justin, tell me about some old symbols. Is that what you want to talk about? Yeah. Did you have another idea? Uh, no, no, this is a good one. Uh, discovery uh, by archaeologists uh, from the uh, Hebrew University and the University of Hafia and a team led uh, by the Le Centre National de la Research Scientifique, which I believe is in France. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a good guess. <laughs> <laughs> have uncovered evidence of what Peut-être. may be the <laughs> earliest known use of symbols. This, uh, this is not like drumming, though. This is like <laughs> written. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> but um, bum. Sorry. Uh, the, the, although the oldest known symbols are made out of giant rock slabs Ooh. that can be played. They're insane. Um, but no, this is, uh, those, those are much, those are much more recent. <laughs> Maybe 10,000 years old. I don't know. Uh, symbols were found uh, cut into bone fragments from the Ramel region in central Israel and are believed to be approximately 120,000 years old. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Uh, remarkably, the fragments remained largely intact and the researchers were able to detect six similar etchings on one side of the bone, leading them to believe that they were in possession of something which held symbolic or spiritual significance. The find, which is uh, published uh, as a Quartinary International, was discovered in a trove of flint tools and animal bones exposed at the site uh, during an an archaeological uh, excavation. So they think this was a Paleolithic hunter camp meeting place, hangout spot where they'd like get together, slaughter animals, Talk about where they'd seen other animals going, maybe. Uh, Bone is believed to have come from an extinct wild cattle uh, that was very common in the Middle East at that time, but no no longer exists. So they did some 3D imaging. They did some microscopic methods of analysis, uh, and they reproduced these engravings in the laboratory. And they got six different engravings, which, if you look at it, is basically like six almost straight parallel lines to each other. Sort of looks like primitive doodling. But uh, the Dr. Iris Gorman Yaroslavsky of the University of Hafe explained, based on our laboratory analysis and discovery of microscopic elements, we were able to surmise that the people of the prehistoric times used a sharp tool fashioned from flint rock to make these engravings. Paper's authors stress that their analysis makes it very clear that engravings were definitely intentionally man-made, could not have been made by animal butchering activities. Uh, They also looked at, um, they were able to determine that this was performed by somebody who was Mm right-handed and (laughs) that it was done in a single working session. So this was, was done all at one time. It also looks like they went from right to left. I don't know why I think that, but that is kind of how it looks. Mm-hmm. And that's also how Hebrew's written. <laughs> right to left. That's interesting. So, I don't know. It's a coincidence, I'm sure. It's 100,000 years. But <laughs> it, it's very. it really does look like 
the it's kind of slanting towards the left. But in terms of what it looks like, it looks like the, like somebody was trying but, to put lines, yeah, vertical <laughs> lines. How, yeah. However, on a, however, on a if bone. you if you take it and you turn it upside down, the image that you're seeing, it looks then the they same. would be going the other way. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's fair. So I'm not really sure. Yeah, they don't know it, which. Well, so so that's an interesting point. So how do they know it was someone who was right-handed then? Because you could just turn it upside down. Yeah, they also make the inference that it could be symbolic or spiritual, which is also a lot of inferencing going on for a couple or, of parallel lines on a piece of bone. Yeah, it could just be somebody put scratched parallel lines in a piece of bone because they were bored. Yeah, yeah. Could it just? I, it also just could be like them inadvertent doodling. Right? Like that was the other counting. Thing I was thinking, is mm -hmm. They could be doing a ledger. Yeah, they were keep, keeping score of their pinochle game. I don't know. Yeah. This is uh, Marian, Marian Prevost from the Institute Archaeology at Hebrew University. She says that uh, every indication was that this was a definite message behind. There was a definite message behind what was being carved into the bone. We reject any assumption that these grooves were some sort of inadvertent doodling. That type of artwork wouldn't have seen this level of attention to detail. Which is kind of like, there's not a lot of detail there. But the idea that there was a doodle form of this is what she's almost, uh, her assumption is that for this to have been Paleolithic doodling, it would have been much simpler. All right. Simpler <laughs> than <laughs> lines. Is, yeah. I feel like we're, we're sitting here, we're, we're picking this apart. But also Somebody keep in mind that like, we, somebody gets a toe bone from a dinosaur and is like, it looked like this. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's they're, they're extremely well-educated guesses. We don't understand the entire depth of research and knowledge and, um, you we know. We don't. Um, I'm also going to I'm also going to say though that it, it could also I mean it's an inflated self of a uh, sense of self-importance and an inflated sense of the research meaning something and I it could mm -hmm. be I mean but you are absolutely right the people who wrote this paper know much much more about this than we do so yeah yes. i'm just throwing it out there i agree it's like a lot it sounds like a lot from a little thing with some scratches on it but just I'm throw it out there. There's there's a whole background of research that we're not privy to, so it's you yeah. Know. Maybe know. the other bones in the pile had the the significance of all the bones and other other leftovers. Yeah, Maybe that yeah tells a bigger story. Yeah, it can. I mean, I, I I'll buy that this may be one of the earliest forms of a carving on bone intentionally that we've seen for it to, for you to get into symb uh, to say it's this is symbolic right like this is meaning then we need more context we need i need a call and response i don't mm -hmm. i need it yeah. not just a deciphering because like cuneiform looks like nonsense to me to yeah. this day but if the sumerians had a language and it was mostly like you know, who owed who, how many bushels of wheat or whatever. And it was like day to day. Like they literally had like iPhone size tablets that they were writing on most of the time. And these things are discarded. Like they found tons of this. We know it's writing. This is uh, carving on a bone, which you're doing already when you are. Yes, this is different than butchering the animal. But you're already there. You might be like, hey, is this a good knife blade? Ah, oh, you know what? I kind of think this one is. Yeah, this is pretty good. Look how it cuts into this. Like you or don't. You, or you have a job within your tribe of people that's really boring and you're biding your time watching the, sh watching the deer or the sheep, you know, whatever, whatever it was. You know, I'm more interested to find out, out who yeah. the people were who were doing the yes. carving. Yes. Than it is. That than it story. is really what the. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I like it. That's a good story. Takes it into a deeper, deeper human meaning. Okay, you know what the biggest human deep thing is? Is that first sip of coffee in the morning. <gasps> oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> it's a good morning coffee. It's amazing. And we keep talking about how 
climate change is going to be threatening a bunch of coffee plants and there are fungal species that are attacking the the coffee plants. There is one particular fungus called coffee rust, which is threatening Arabica beans particularly. Um, but there are funguses like this that threaten these plants and these plantations and the crop of coffee. We must have the coffee. So researchers have been trying to figure out ways to address the coffee rust problem. And one group found another fungus that seems to have, they think, potentially an evolutionary relationship with the coffee rust fungus and that they they control each other. So the researchers uh, are looking at this fungus in Ethiopia as a potential solution to the coffee leaf rust problem. They don't know for sure yet, but they are definitely going to investigate it a bit more. What they found is that coffee leaf rust generally increases during the rainy to the dry season. And then there's this hyperparasite, they're calling it the hyperparasite, that lives on top of the coffee rust fungus. And as the coffee rust fungus gets eaten away, the hyperparasite increases from the dry to the rainy season. So they kind of balance each other over the seasons. And it seems to be a stable relationship in Ethiopia. And in plantations in Ethiopia where the Arabica beans were very managed, they had more problems with coffee rust than unmanaged, more naturally uh, fostered crops that allow the hyperparasite to grow. And they, so the next question is, does it have any impact on the actual output of beans from the plants? They don't know this yet, and so that's what they need to look at. But um, biocontrol is a potential direction for these crops that are, are we have uh, taken out of their native growing environments and moved around the world to different places. Those parasites, the funguses, might come with them and spread as well. But how do you how do you take up some kind of biocontrol as opposed to bringing pesticides to keep the fungus at bay? Will it make my coffee taste like mushrooms? No. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. And the researchers actually say that, like, they they think that this is an evolved relationship between the coffee plant, the coffee leaf rust, and the hyperparasite. That's a very interesting. Yeah, they do better together. Huh. Yeah. I wonder since so coffee as a monoculture crop is kind of problematic, and there's a mm. movement to do a um. I forget what it's called, but it's when you when you grow multiple crops on one piece of land and they, they kind of work with each other, just like vanilla needs a little bit of shade. Coffee actually does well with some shade also. Mm -hmm. So you can you can do different level, different height plants in the same plot of land and yeah, farm multiple things at once. So I would wonder if we were trying to move that way with coffee anyway, since the monoculture is so problematic would this fungus relationship potentially mess with that actually? And if you tried to grow other crops in that same space, would that be a problem? I don't know. Yeah. Would this yeah. fungus interact with other plants? That's a, that's a big question. Um, it does seem to do better. So the coffee plants and the hyper fungus like being in the shade of the trees. So like you're, you're talking about, these multi-layered plantations, that's something that they are thinking is definitely a good direction to go. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, biocontrol, you always have to think about the other things yeah. that your biological control could, could affect. Yeah. Well, because that's the, that's my problem. I, I depend on coffee so much and I love coffee so much. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Stop, 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 so stop, 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 stop. My this is coffee. right. Okay. No, this is the problem. There would never be a threat to coffee supply. You can get the good stuff. If we, really if we cheap. didn't like if coffee? If you stop telling it, if we just stopped, all co coffee drinkers kept telling everybody how great coffee is. Just pretend it sucks. Oh, coffee, it's like this terrible, awful thing. Kids, you don't want... 
If the next Terrible. generation, if the next generation drinks coffee like we drink coffee, we're gonna be out of coffee. That's just all it's gonna come down to. It's Does gonna that be work out of so coffee. well with fossil fuels? We're just not. There's not enough of it. Wait, what? <laughs> if we drink enough coffee, we're gonna run everywhere. Um, no, I don't know. It's a Maybe. finite resource, people. It is. There's only so many coffee beans that the planet can support, and I think we're using all of them right now. It's okay. I know not everyone drinks coffee, and good for you if you don't drink coffee. That's great. That's good. Because it's terrible stuff. You don't get don't get started. It's just nasty. Ugh. More for us. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. If you are interested in some item of our merchandise, head over to twist.org and click on the Zazzle store link. You could be like Justin and wear a Twist sweatshirt. He's got a Twist sweatshirt on tonight. A pretty great, cool sweatshirt with some of Blair's art on the back. That's right. Zazzle store. Twist.org can help support twists all right let's come on back for the fantastic covid update mm. is it fantastic because we can't <laughs> sleep because we've got so much anxiety the covid update i just made that mm -hmm. up okay mm -hmm. accurate <laughs> accurate it's true there is some very interesting research highlighted by the CDC this week, which um, I, I just really enjoyed one particular study out of um, that is published in Science Advances this week that the CDC highlighted, which is titled Airflows Inside Pas Passenger Cars and Implications for Airborne Disease Transmission. So if you like to hop in an Uber or a Lyft and ride share with other people, this study is for you. Looking at airflow in cars, they found that when driving at 50 miles an hour, having the front right and the rear left windows open, so across the car, this isn't in a single cab truck, this is a vehicle with front seats, back seats, the front right window open, back left, re rear left window open, driver sitting in the front right, passenger in front Driver in the front left, <laughs> passenger in the rear right. The airflow was pulled in through the rear window and circulated around the car in such a way as to create what they called an air curtain that protected would protect the passenger from any germs that the driver might have. Yeah, so because it's, it's coming in the front passenger seat and exiting the rear window, right? But that's it, not so much. The way that the oh. airflow actually works is because of the way that the air gets sucked into the car. Most of the air is entering through the rear window, circulating around, and Whoa. then getting pulled back from the front window past the driver to the back to the rear window again. It's a very interesting airflow pattern that I actually did not expect. So the, the dynamics of it are really interesting. Weird. Yeah. They did not test this at lower speeds. They didn't test it with, um, you know, more make-believe passengers who could be, could be infected. They didn't, they didn't test it with a whole bunch of variables. But if you're a single passenger in your rideshare vehicle or if you're going to go pick somebody up, know that you can... Um, help increase your safety with a very uh, simple opposite kind of kitty corner open windows and seating wow. situation. Yeah. It's interesting. very interesting. Very interesting stuff. Hmm. And also in the this particular highlight uh, from the CDC were a couple of studies that imply children under 20 years of age are less likely to show symptoms, be symptomatic with uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and are also highly likely to spread the SARS-CoV-2 virus, more likely than had before been expected. And as we are talking about trying to get kids back to school and with these more highly contagious variants, 
on the rise, maybe this is information that uh, school districts and governors of states should be taking into account. So um, get those teachers vaccinated, please. Yeah. Get the no, teachers no, vaccinated no, and we... get the grandparents vaccinated and just Let's not okay. put the kids back. In. No, okay. don't do the six weeks thing. We've already talked about I, that. I, I, and you just even, jumped in here. And you... wasn't even, it wasn't even the, what I was going to say. Okay. Uh, but this is, this is more proof that we need to reverse the order of the vaccines. Give it to the young. If you want to open schools, then vaccinate the children. If you want the college kids back on campus, vaccinate them first. But do, well, you know. no, because we don't. The thing is, we don't. So right now, we are working from the the knowledge that it, the vaccine protects the person who's vaccinated, but we don't know whether right. vaccinated people and can why, still spread why infection. Do we still not know that. How can so they, they basically that? they didn't test that when they were testing yeah. the efficacy of the vaccine because they were trying to yeah. get it out. So yeah. that was something that they did not. So now they're trying to collect data on that currently while they're vaccinating people. Yeah. Because it was more important to get it passed so that people who are constantly actually exposed could be protected. <laughs> Yeah, well, when I'm, yeah. When I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is this is this is not a study that can be done in the United States. I absolutely agree because we have no testing. We have uncontrolled available. spread. Also, we have we have yeah. uncontrolled spread, and we have no testing. We have no. But in scenarios of places that still are able to test and contact trace. That's what that it needs to get figured out there because yeah. uh, it's ridiculous that we don't know it. And yet there's millions it's, of it people. Makes, infected. Yeah, it just makes it it makes the whole situation more complicated. But we are currently vaccinating more people each day than are being infected globally. Yes. This is great news. OK. There is also, there, I have one, I have a couple of little brief bad news stories for you, and then I've got good news, okay? So I want to okay. end the COVID update on, on good news. But first, let's talk about these new variants. There are a bunch of them circulating, increasing numbers, because, hey, they're more easily transmissible. They love grabbing onto that ACE2 receptor, nice and strong, helps them get access to the cells more easily, so fewer viral particles are necessary for an infection. Wow. Anyway, a preprint in BioArchives suggests that the mRNA vaccines in use are still effective against these these mutants, these are new mutations that are making the transmissibility more effective, but they're also starting to evade our defenses a little bit. And so even though these mRNA vaccines are still effective, there is a reduction in their effectiveness when they've been tested in laboratory situations, sometimes up to tenfold reduction in their effectiveness which would mean that we definitely need as many people vaccinated as mm -hmm. possible as quickly as possible. Well, and I think the they, they even said at one point that uh, between even like six, some people said 60 and some people said 80% efficacy would still be, effect be effective at reopening the country if everybody got it. 90. <laughs> so yeah, so, so higher is better, yeah. but I remember higher there were better. people saying like, if the vaccine is 60% effective, push it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, abs and they uh, and they are, 100%. which is uh, another aspect of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, um, the o Oxford AstraZeneca. They are going that is less effective after the first shot. But and it is in the 60 percent to 70 percent effectiveness range. But it seems to become more effective over time that the body's immune response yeah, improves after within the weeks after having gotten the vaccine and so they're thinking that this is the that this single shot with a lower effectiveness it's still effective but mm -hmm. it's it's going to help reduce transmission which that's what we want mm -hmm. Anyway, in the treatment side of things, we have been using some of these monoclonal antibody treatments, which are basically antibodies that go in and neutralize the spike protein and make it unable to 
attached to our cells to gain entry. Another study looked at a particular mutation, that's the N439K mutation, found that the monoclonal antibody treatments are less effective against the variants that have this change. So not only are these variants starting to evade our defenses, but they're also starting to evade these antibodies and this particular kind of treatment. So the monoclonal antibodies, that's the remdesivir um, the treatment um, that people with money are getting. <laughs> Not everybody's been able to get. So we'll see how long that remains viable as a, as a treatment and a good treatment. Good news. Good news. There have been questions about whether people who are pregnant should get vaccinated. The decision was made to allow pregnant women, pregnant people, to get vaccinated. And there is now evidence from a study out in JAMA that not from vaccines, but from COVID infections, that there is evidence of antibodies, immunoglobulins produced as a result of the infection during the mother's bodies um, fighting the virus, that they're finding those immunoglobulins in the cord blood. The fact that they're in the cord blood mm. in the placenta means that these antibodies are very likely to be getting to the fetus. And so if they're getting to the fetus, that means that the mother is passing the immunity Unity. along to the baby, yeah. which is great. Yes. So other vaccines, they've seen very similar effects and so they believe that vaccines of pregnant women could confer immunity to the babies so that's good news very good news and finally let's get happy some happy treatment there is a study out this week suggesting that a an antidepressant an ssri called flu fluvoxamine might help treat COVID-19. We've reported on this before, and there have been a couple of studies previously, but this new one was a trial that took place in California at the uh, the Oakland race, was it the Berkeley racetrack? The Berkeley racetrack in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it is, most of the employees are Hispanic, right around Thanksgiving, when there was a huge spike in infections, they had a big outbreak of COVID-19. There was a doctor who had had applied for money from um, a private fund that is funding projects to see if drugs that have already been authorized for use for different uses by the FDA could also be used to treat COVID-19. Got some of that money randomized the, the groups, like half of the, uh, about 60% of the, the people had COVID and wanted to get this treatment. 40% didn't. What they found, there were no hospitalizations in the group that got the two-week course of the SSRI. And in the placebo group, there were multiple ho hospitalizations and two ventilations and I, I believe one, a death, one or two deaths that were correlated. So it's not a randomized control trial, but it is another piece of evidence suggesting that this SSRI, which also acts on a very specific receptor, a sigma receptor, to reduce the body's immune response, hmm. could be helpful for treatments moving forward. Hmm. Yeah. So it's not at the point of, hey, everybody, this is what you need right now. But doctors are starting to go, oh, well, if I have a really, really like a patient who's really on the ropes and looking bad, maybe this is something that we could try. So it's starting to hit that point. Nice. Yeah. Happy news. More treatments, possibly. Research is moving along. We are getting there. There's hope. <laughs> Life could get Was, back to normal by 2022, perhaps. Ish. 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 Yeah. That's right. Okay. This COVID update, unless there is something really, really big that happens over the next couple of weeks, we're going what I'm going to try is a uh -oh. new a new um strategy for the show where we will do a COVID update at the beginning of the month and we'll we'll 
alternate weeks. Uh oh. Uh oh. Have we got COVID? Have we got COVID fatigue? Have we got, got COVID of, reporting? I think everybody's issues. trying to make my yeah. twist prediction come true right away. <laughs> right away. I'm also going to try and split it up with interviews so that we have at least two interviews a month That'd and awesome. we have a reduced number of COVID updates, but really try and give you good news, like the give you the news when we do the COVID update. Just so you know, this is This Week in Science. <gasps> Hey, you know what time it is? What time is it? I think it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair? She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. Hey, God bless. Uh, well, I have a story about singing crickets and how traffic noise could be messing their mating strategy up. So this is from Ang- Anglia Ruskin University. And look, it's looking at the mating behavior of crickets, famously known for singing. Um, and it looks like their mating behavior is affected by traffic noise and other man-made sounds. This, of course, has implications on other animals and crickets worldwide. But so they were studying the mating choices of female field crickets, that's Grelis bimaculatus, under different acoustic conditions. They paired female crickets with silenced male crickets. (laughs) Was that a cricket? Um, (laughs) They paired them with silenced male crickets. That's important so that they could then play cricket sounds to control for the individual. So they had these silenced male crickets and then they would pipe in ambient noise, artificial white noise and traffic noise. So they had these kind of different levels of competing sounds with cricket song. And then they would play cricket songs of varying quality. This is important because the females are already choosing males based on the quality of their song. So they have to make sure that they're not crossing their wires here, that they're playing, that a cricket has a bad song and there's traffic noise that could be confounding variables, right? So instead they're all silent. They're playing different quality of cricket song as far as female crickets are concerned. And then they have these different noises in the background. So in control conditions of ambient noise, females mounted the males much sooner and more frequently when they had a high quality courtship song. So normal, wild sounds, low, not really intrusive. And then, oh, that's a good mating song? Great, I'm ready. Okay, however, high quality songs had no benefit versus low quality songs in white noise or traffic noise conditions. So the females are not doing a good job of picking out the good cricket songs when there are these other sounds happening in the background of um, the white noise or traffic noise. So they were not influenced by the presence of song at all. Um, there's, There's a little cricket. Is that a high quality cricket song or a low quality cricket song? You decide. (laughs) I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah. So the bottom line here is that man-made noise, this white noise or traffic noise, which by the way, they got the traffic noise by actually putting these containers of crickets next to a freeway, which I thought was great. (laughs) Uh, No better source. Ambient noise, the freeway, yes. Uh, So... Uh, the man-made noise does alter how females perceive males when making mate choice decisions. So there's a couple ways that this could impact um, the future generations of crickets and other animals who have sexual signals that are auditory around man-made sounds. So the first would be that, um, actually, the researcher said I didn't even think about it, is that the male crickets might actually try to expend even more energy to make even better songs 
because they're not getting an edge on other crickets. But what I see here is the likelihood that there would be a reduction or loss of good quality cricket sounds in general. Everyone would just become kind of lousy at, at singing. But there's also an expectation that the quality of the cricket song is somehow linked to fitness. So the other problem here, the really big problem is not just like, oh man, we might not hear crickets anymore. It might actually lead to a reduction in offspring viability because a good song is supposed to be linked to fitness. So if you are not selecting for a good song, you are no longer selecting for fitness, that could have huge problems on the fitness of crickets. So, I mean, the long and short of this is like, hey, humans make a lot of unnatural sounds. It's messing with animals that talk to each other. <laughs> we knew that already. We've done yeah. stories about bird song and all this kind of stuff. But it's interesting to hear it from, about um, invertebrates also. And to kind of see this very specific delineation where even white noise, just, just unnatural white noise, was also causing problems, not just traffic sounds. Just anything that is so, increasing the volume of the environment and making it harder to for other sounds to propagate. I mean, white noise is great at blocking other noise. So, I mean, yep. so many people have white noise generators or pink noise generators for to help them sleep because what they is live pink in a noisy. noise. <laughs> it's different frequencies, but yeah. Oh, I didn't even know about that. Yeah. yeah, and the only reason that people use those things is because they can't sleep with all the sounds of those crickets outside. Yeah. It's just, God, <laughs> so many how are, crickets. Yeah. How, are, how are the crickets out at your bus? So uh, they're there, but not that strong. So what's really interesting is there has been a massive drop-off in crickets, in, I think, in Yolo County. Yeah. Because as I remember as a child... It was a symphony of crickets every night, yeah. and it doesn't yeah. exist anymore. I can't hear it. I haven't heard that anywhere, even out in the country. It's, it, you don't get that. I wonder if that's because there are less amphibians, because it's the whole, like, wolves in Yellowstone Park thing, right? There were also, yeah, there were also lots mm -hmm. of amphibians. Uh, and there are fewer there were lots of, of frogs. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I don't know. It's it's an interesting question. Where are all the crickets going? And this also might be part of it. Maybe they just can't find each other or that they're mating with inferior males. Well, well, we okay. Bounce. So I did, I did remember. <laughs> Whatever okay, males is, are here. This yeah. is uh, sort of anecdotal, but I it may be that those were both unnatural phenomenon here. <laughs> when they recreated the, the wetlands. We got all of these uh, cranes and herons and all like this huge assortment of waterfowl bird mm -hmm. uh, that now show up to the area. Um, and it was about that same time when the amphibians disappeared. So mm -hmm. so it could be the, the birds wetlands. birds eating the amphibians. <laughs> I, I don't know who got the crickets. That was probably poison that people yeah. were well, putting on there. <laughs> It's very but weird. also the wetlands were for sure put there for the amphibians. So that's that's an interesting no, thing. No, 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 no. They were put there for the birds, these ones. These are this is a bird sanctuary where they, mm. they flood, but they only flood it uh for them to to like the ducks and the stuff when they're migrating. A lot of the rest of the year the, the water's not there. Interesting. I think yeah, it's so called the rainy season. Yeah, but it doesn't <laughs> rain enough to do that. What they do is they <laughs> pull it off of the they pull it off of the, the uh, Sacramento River, the American yeah. River, and they push it over to, yeah. And then the rest of the year, it's rice fields. Yes. That's huh. true. Yeah. Interesting. Anyway. All right. Well, anyway, crickets. Crickets. Um, and uh, moving on from, from fitness of crickets to fitness of some other animals. Uh, this is a very, this is an extremely preliminary, um, just kind of a look at uh, animals and specific strategies for getting help from relatives in raising their young. This is a, a, some biologists from University of Bristol have a new argument that they want to explore that some animals might use blackmail to coerce relatives 
into assisting with the rearing of the young. So, Ooh. yes. So in the historical way that we've looked at family members helping with the raising of young, this is the Darwinian hypothesis that family members help because there are shared genes. And so they help because the cost benefit analysis shows this is also called um, Hamilton's rule. Actually, so it wasn't Darwin. Um, it they will help if it leads to a net increase in copies of your genes in a population. So if um, if I help my brother raise his kids, then my genes will benefit because there are some of my genes in those kids. So is the cost benefit analysis beneficial to me? But this new exploration is looking at manipulation wherein an individual can threaten to harm their own survival or their own reproductive success if relatives withhold help. <laughs> oh, so, it's emotional blackmail. It's, now it makes sense. Yes. Now it yeah. seems normal. It is. I'm so mad at you. I'm going to hold my breath. <gasps> I'm going to pass out. I'm going to really do it. <laughs> and it's anyway. your fault that I'm yeah. doing it. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah, that emotional blackmail sounds like human families. Yes. So a, an example that they saw in the wild is that um, a mother wasp may lay a large clutch and all but exhaust her energy reserves, laying so many eggs. So unless a relative steps in to help, the babies may not uh, survive. Neither may the mother. <laughs> So it's kind of like, oh, whoopsie. Guess you'll have to help me now. You have no choice. <laughs> um, yeah. And this so, is how social species begin. <laughs> yeah. So it's about putting shared genes in jeopardy. They they mm. also like to think about this uh, in terms of a doomsday device. So if you think about how a doomsday device works in kind of modern culture, it's a mechanism that will trigger a disastrous nuclear strike if a rival makes an unwelcome move, right? So this is this is part of what the Cold War was about, was like, you might nuke us, but I'm gonna nuke you then, and then we're all gonna be nuked. So it's like, <laughs> if animals can tie uh, their own survival or reproductive success to a partner's behavior, then the threat of self-sabotage becomes credible. So this preliminary paper looked at whether blackmail between kin is theoretically possible. And they did a bunch of mathematical science. <laughs> they looked at it and it is viable. Under the right conditions, it can, it can evolve and be selected for in these social species. So under this illusion of harmonious cooperation among relatives, some animals might have been given no choice. <laughs> so hopefully no we'll get more choice. on that in, in the coming years. I would say I'd love to see a paper actually detailing this in a specific species or looking at some of the pro-con kind of data that we might have about how well this works. But it is a very interesting look at something where We'd love to think about animals as like, oh yeah, they love to help each other. Like that's why we have grandmas, right? Is is so that they can help with the fitness of their genes that are in their grandchildren. And it's just a big happy family. And maybe but maybe not. they were blackmailed into it and grandma yeah. really wanted to go have her own life. <laughs> uh -huh. And they were like, okay, you can do that. But <gasps> uh, uh, but I think that's, isn't that the same, I mean, then that's the same motivation though. It's, I mean, yeah, it's you have to help motivation. because you want your genes to prosper and continue, even though you, uh, this, that's why, how you're right. getting uh, emotionally black. Well, it's, you know, it's like the, it's like the, the adult child that lives in the basement. Like you really like them to go live on their own but you're not gonna put them out on the street right so it's i think yeah i think you're right it's the same net result as you're trying to protect your genes yeah but it's just 
the reasoning behind it is different. The urgency. The motivation. Yeah, the, yeah, absolutely. The, the motivation, yeah. I think, is the same. The urgency. Well, so, uh, no, the motivation is different because yeah. it's it's a threat versus um, a just a want to help with with a general success. I think it's the same. It's just both times you're wanting it's to It's not. It's not because if you think about like true altruism is you're trying to and that's separate from this. This is not altruistic behavior because mm-hmm. you're benefiting because your genes are benefiting. But if you think about yeah. altruism, it's different from symbiosis because yeah. One is you're helping another being and you're getting nothing in return. And another one is you are helping another being because you're getting something in return. So there are different motivations for different strategies in the animal kingdom. And those small differences matter. Okay, I still don't believe in that, that definition of altruism, but that's, that's, I think there is still a selfish motivation behind that. Um, which is part, being part of, uh, being part of a herd or a community, which is that that's your duty. That's the expected that you're going to be uh, helpful and compliant to others when they need it, because that's what you get also out of being part of that so community. So, are you returning the wallet you found on the street in the hopes that someone else would do the same for you, or are you returning that wallet that you found on the street because you want fifty dollars as a reward? That is the difference. I don't see it. Oh, well, okay, that's, uh, no, I think it's the same. Then everybody's always doing it because they're going to get their wallet back or it's going back to their community. That's or, the idea different. of reciprocity. Yes, yeah. yeah. so, uh, so there's there's differences there. There's I a difference in an expectation of mutual response and respect and a reward. Those are different things. I disagree. I think both of them have that same reward. I, I think they do. I think they both, they absolutely do have a, a selfish motivation behind both of them. I never yeah. said it wasn't selfish. I yeah. said the reward was different and the motivation was different. The reward's yes. different. Yeah. The so there's an interesting article about this right now in Nature in the wow, news. Wow, people are quick. News. We just had a conversation. Somebody's know, already done a, a paper on it. Yeah, there's a there's a paper out now on the evolution of altruism and the serial rediscovery of the role of relatedness. Like seriously this conversation right now. Um and they talk about Hamilton's rule in the 1960s, the evolutionary biologist W.D. Hamilton came up with a solution to the problem of altruism. So how did it evolve and could it have evolved without relatedness being a part of it? Um, But anyway, there's a whole paper on it. I haven't read it. But uh, from what I can tell from skimming, it concludes that um, relatedness is pretty much it. That's what starts altruism out there is a role for relatedness for altruism to evolve the genes you got to be in it for your genes at some point but the motivation makes a big difference what is that motivation Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah oh have you seen the 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 whales i i put an i put a note because you were talking about the 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 cr- the crickets earlier Blair oh, the whales yes there are whales there's a, a paper out currently um, oh yes Puget about Sound? whales in Patagonia and Ooh. how they are avoiding traffic and there was a an a, a, a gif that was shared on social media last night that had that showed this poor whale with a tracker on it that was mm-hmm. tracked and all of the traffic paths of ships within a particular bay and the um the the terrible efforts that it seemed to be making to avoid the traffic to to go after the plankton that it was trying to feed on anyway there is a paper out right now and there is uh, i think you can find an article about this also in the guardian right now hmm. yeah no oh, humans mess everything up <laughs> Humans, we're messing it all up. This is This Week in Science. We are here again to talk with you about all the science things that we loved this week. Thank you for listening. 
If you are listening and enjoying the show, maybe consider supporting the show. We do take donations through our, through PayPal and also through the Patreon platform. You can click on the Patreon link at twist.org, head over to Patreon, and choose your level of support. Those over $10 per month get thanked by name at the end of the show. Your name could be read in the list. Help us make that list longer. We can't do this without your support. We thank you for your support. All righty. Justin, do you have some news for us? Uh, yeah, I don't know a particular order I got it in, but this is uh, anthropologists from the University of Zurich. They want to know what monkeys were thinking about when other monkeys were talking. So they shot them in the face. Wait, what? With non-invasive thermal imaging guns, able to measure temperature changes in the faces of the marmoset monkeys to quantify subtle uh, emotional responses that they were having. So monkeys uh, experience an increase in emotional arousal. They will then show a drop in facial surface temperature, especially on the nose because it's not covered by furry stuff. Uh, Says first author Rahel Brugge, PhD candidate, Department of Anthropology, University of Zurich, we were able to use this technique to show that the marmosets did not perceive the vocal interactions between conspecifics as the mere sum of the single call elements, but rather perceived them holistically as a conversation. So, basically, two monkeys are talking. Instead of just that monkey reacting to each single call separately, was reacting to the conversation that was taking place between these other monkeys. For their study, these uh, researchers used playbacks, uh, vocal exchanges between marmosets, as well as calls of individual animals who were not involved in an interaction. They played the corresponding playbacks from a hidden loudspeaker, used the thermo- thermography to measure the monkeys' reactions to the various simulations. This showed that the responses to the individual, uh, to the call interactions was significantly different than the responses of just individual calls. So they could tell the difference between a conversation and monkey monologues. In the simulations, the researchers additionally distinguished between cooperative and competitive interactions. After the monkeys had heard different interactions, they were then given an opportunity to go closer to the sounds that they were hearing from the the separate uh, speakers that they had playing back and forth. The researchers observed the marmosets preferred to approach the simulated uh, monkey sounds in the conversation who had been involved in a cooperative interaction with the third party. That preference actually fits the social system and natural behavior of these small Brazilian New World monkeys who are cooperative breeders and depend on the cooperativeness of others in their group. This is uh, Judith Burkhart, also an uh, anthropologist. This study adds to the growing evidence that many animals are not only passive observers of third-party interactions, but that they also interpret them. In addition, our study shows that thermography can help Unveil how these social interactions are perceived in nonverbal subjects. I feel like if you couldn't re- read the room, read the treetops <laughs> yeah. as a social animal, that would be that would be pr- that would be a big mistake. That would that would mean death a lot of the time. I feel like. Yeah, and especially with uh, animals that are social. In nature, you want to be able to understand what your conspecifics are talking about or, Mm -hmm. okay, are you just shouting at the sky or are you talking about a predator or have you found a food source? Mm -hmm. Um, There are cute little marmoset that you got your eye on. I don't know. What are you talking about? And you also want to be able to, as we've talked about in the Animal Corner so many times, um, be able to read the other animals in mm-hmm. the local environment what are they doing what signals are they giving off so this is yeah and it, but I, I like the thermography as a way of being able to read the emotional state so how 
excited or interested based on blood flow. That's kind of a that's a very interesting perspective. Yeah, it's a it's a nice way of being able to monitor the monkey without having uh, drilled holes into the skull or. <laughs> right. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> what are you paying attention to, monkey? Yeah. Non-invasive. You get a little bit better mm. natural feel for behavior that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. It's a neat setup. Although, I mean, externally, I guess we we people who study marmosets probably have a good idea of what physical behaviors mean. Mm-hmm. Whether certain facial, like putting your face in a particular way, is aggressive or not aggressive, or excited or not aggressive you know, holding your body in a particular way, what that means. Yeah. Yeah. If you can, if you can use AI to interpret the position of horses ears to figure out how they're feeling about a situation. Yes. I feel like you could definitely do the same with monkey faces. It would be very cool to do both together. Mm -hmm. Is the, is some sort of AI looking at monkey faces, the expressions that they're making coupled Mm -hmm. with, the I like that yeah the the heat distribution in their face yeah and 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 why mm-hmm. this is also important is that even though the researchers might be able to look at the little monkey and say oh i can tell how the monkey is doing right now or what the monkey that's not science you can't you can't mm-hmm. translate that into a paper you can't say mm-hmm. well how do you know the horse is hungry well i could just tell by looking at the horse that's how i do it yeah <laughs> then you're just a horse whisperer you're not doing science right you need to be able to get it Have away a measure from- you need yeah. a measure that doesn't have human observation as its sole. Uh, yeah, that's a great metric. point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, great. and and there's definitely the the indescribable thing. I mean, when I was a zookeeper, all the time. I mean, all the time. There were times where I would I would go to the the zoo vets and be like, "So and so, there's something wrong with them." Yeah. And they would say, "Well, well, why do you think that?" <laughs> I just I, know. Just yeah. got a hunch. <laughs> I, got a, I, I, I just could got just, a hunch. There's something Sounds wrong weird. with them. I don't know. And, you know, eventually we were able to figure out they were eating less. This was happening. That was happening. They would get taken in and they, it would, to the vet and they'd figure out what's going on. But there was this weird kind of aura of there's something weird there. So, yes, there's something that... that um, You're making observations that yes. you haven't translated into specifics Correct. and you and it's still triggering it's the, the proper gestalt. response. Yeah. I mean, yes. I, I did an emotional intelligence training for my job earlier today and they did a quiz where they showed people's faces and you had to say what expression it meant, which actually sounds a lot easier than it is for the average person. I mean, some of them yeah. are really easy, but some of them are harder. And... Um, and they actually pointed out what about that person's face indicates that they're happy or sad or shy or embarrassed or in pain. So they mm. pick out these little things and that's exactly it. There's stuff going on that you notice that you can't quantify and you just go, mm-hmm. that person's mad. I know that. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Fascinating. You got another study? Got another story, Justin? Uh, sure. Uh, this is the... Uh... Uh, freshwater oceans of the not so distant past. Uh, the Arctic Ocean, which is the one up in the top there, was uh-huh. covered by 0.9 kilometers of ice at one point, or uh, 900 meters, if you're not familiar with kilometers, it was entirely filled underneath with uh, fresh water uh, twice in the last 150,000 years. This uh, this was uh, reported in the lat- latest issue of the journal Nature, result of a long time or long term research uh, by scientist Alfred Wegener at the Institute of Marum. Uh, and uh, so, basically, what they've done is a detailed analysis of the composition of marine deposits that uh, could demonstrate that the Arctic Ocean, as well as the Nordic Seas, that below. Norway and Sweden and north of Germany and Denmark did not contain sea salt in that water. And at huh. least two glacial age, uh, glacial periods in the last 150,000 years. Kind of seems, I mean, it makes sense once you picture the glacier there that it's only fresh water that's going into these areas that have, are evacuated, right? These lower elevation 
places where seas are currently. Uh, but it's really weird to think of that much fresh water in those places. Uh, detailed analysis uh, illustrates this. The water uh, then also was occasionally released into the North Atlantic in very short time periods with sort of, you'd end up with this freshwater underground lake or a freshwater at ground level uh, lake but the, with nine, a, a kilometer of ice on top of it could then shoot out in really short periods into the North Atlantic thereby cooling the North Atlantic, messing up the Atlantic conveyor belt, and they think it has been responsible for a couple of the rapid climate oscillations that they've <laughs> seen in those regions that they didn't really have any good explanation for. Oh. So uh, about 60 to 70,000 years ago, a particularly cold part of the last glacial period, large parts of Northern Europe, North America, were covered by ice sheets, European ice sheet. Uh, spanned a distance of more than 5,000 kilometers from Ireland and Scotland via Scandinavia to the eastern rim of the Kara Sea, which I don't really know where that is. It's somewhere in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, North America, large parts of what uh, is now known as Canada. I don't know if I'm reading <laughs> that right. We're buried <laughs> under two large ice sheets. Greenland and parts of the Bering Sea coastline were also glaciated. It was just a Big old iceberg up up top. Uh, but yeah, there was there was two different periods though. Once about mm. seventy to sixty thousand years ago, one hundred thirty to one hundred fifty thousand years ago, both periods, fresh water accumulated under the ice so much that uh, it can, created a completely fresh water Arctic Ocean for thousands and uh, thousands of years. Is it really? It's a. Is it just a big Arctic lake at that point? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> frozen lake, shaped like a kidney bean. Looks like yes, <laughs> that's what the model makes it look like in this image. Yeah, huh? Yeah, how fascinating that it would get penned in on so many sides by the underwater topography and also by the ice and become and push out all the salt. To the point mm -hmm. that you have that fresh water. That's that's yeah. pretty cool. It does also Which make means... you kind of rethink what we assume we know about the climate of the past and how something like this can totally switch up climactic events and the reasoning behind them. And mm -hmm. right, yeah. And then on top of that, it can make you kind of think about okay, at what point in time did this happen? What animals were evolving? And so if we're talking about you know, different fossils being found in the sediments. You know, why are you finding freshwater fossils in this area as opposed to saltwater fossils? And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. It creates differences. It's pretty cool. Very yeah. cool. You want to hear about brains? brains? Always. Brains! Yes, I have a story about a brain. Well, about brains and then I have a story about feelings because feelings are important too and people want to know about feelings so researchers have been trying to figure out where in our brain the neurons are that make us stop so when you're walking and you realize you're going to accidentally step on something and you have to stop your step action, what are the neurons that stop your already planned action? What if you're in the middle of saying something, you realize you really shouldn't say that thing, so stop, or you're driving and there's suddenly a red light and you have to stop. And then as you're sitting there at the red light, you're like thinking about going and so your foot just comes off the brake pedal a little bit and then you're like oh no 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 stop there's neurons in our brain that are responsible for stopping actions not just it... starting them so yeah. starting an act every the stop it's not the start of a stop it is actually a stop and so there are neurons that are involved in switching your mode from go to stop this almost sounds like the underpinnings, the basis, the foundation, the baseline for free will. 
Maybe a little bit. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if we, if you think about it in a very, at a very deep level. Yeah. But there are neurons and these researchers from Cedars sinai um, they took patients who were, uh, have Parkinson's who were going in to get a, uh, a, an implant put into their brain. So they're undergoing open brain surgery. And during the surgery, the researchers stuck electrodes into a part of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus. Now, this is an area in the basal brain. So this is not higher consciousness processing. This is this is basal level stuff. This is physical reactivity, reflex level stuff almost. And when they were th- making these people who have their have their brains undergoing brain surgery, had them watch a signal and wait for it to put the stop signal on. And then they tested different neurons in the area of the brain to see if there were neurons that changed their behavior when the stop signal was supposed to start. And indeed, they found single neurons that are responsible, that increase their activity when a behavior that has been started, like, I'm going to go push this elevator button. No, I don't want to. Before you stop that action of pushing the elevator button, there are single neurons in the subthalamic nuclei that are telling you to stop, changing the behavior. It's so okay. it, it's not okay. a it, it's not so an on happened? off switch. It's a brake and a gas pedal. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And so these are these are the brake neurons. And then wow. it gives your brain it stops the it stops the signals and then it gives your brain a second to start whatever the new action is. Whatever the next go action is. So so can we knock it out and see what happens? Right. Well, that that's their question, which is there are like in Parkinson's, there are diseases of uh, brain related movement disorders. And the question is whether or not these neurons are involved in these movement disorders and whether we can control them to control movement disorders. So there's, uh, there's some really interesting questions as to where this research is going to go with respect to therapeutics, um, whether or not there's uh, going to be the ability to stop impulsive action. So in the sense of your uh, free will um, for, for disorders where there are twitches that are impulses that you can't control, Mm-hmm. Is there something that can are can these neurons be recruited to control those those disorders? We will see. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. How cool that people undergoing brain surgery are like, yeah, go ahead and do some science. Root around in there. Well, yeah, well, yeah, while yeah, I'm open. Some, while my head's open, just stick some wires in there. Let's see. Yeah. I, I have mean, to say I that think is I would. so. It, <laughs> I would too, but I feel like I, that's so rad. I just have to take a second and everybody who participates in studies, in medical studies, thank you. Such a cool yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very cool. Agreed. All right. Now thinking of maybe, I don't know if this is a cool thing to do or not. We, Justin, you were talking about the thermal imaging of the marmoset faces to determine yes. their emotional state. Well, researchers just published in the Public Library of Science One Plus One a study in which they're using a deep learning frame framework to uh, determine people's emotional state using wireless radio signals. Yeah. Get what? your tinfoil hats, everybody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, if you we have thermal imaging, right, that can detect blood flow changes, we also can detect things like changes in heart rate, changes in breathing that may indicate changes in emotional state. These researchers are using radio signals, bouncing them off of people to be able to measure heart rate and um, other 
other physiological factors that are markers of emotion. And in this, yeah, it's, 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 it can be good for monitoring people, potentially. Um, In the study, they used these wireless signals. They were tracking ECG recordings on people as they were watching movies, various videos, see how the people reacted, and then tried to measure those ECG signals distantly using using radio radio waves. And they were successful in being able to do this. Uh, that so, would be really helpful in the age of masks. Because <laughs> right. I can't tell what people are doing with their face under the mask. Are, do you hate me? Are you happy? What's happening? Oh, this, this readout says, you're frustrated with me. Why is that? Is it because I'm pointing radio waves at you? <laughs> yeah, so their their system was able to learn to identify fairly uh, some emotions, disgust, joy, relaxation, fear, scariness um, from radio frequency and ECG data. And uh, potentially, I mean, I don't know. Is this going to be tracking people in shops? Yes. As you're shopping, yes. uh, tracking people airports. in movie theaters, in airports? Probably. These uh, these technologies are probably going to be used to track us for multiple different reasons. I like to think that, you know, that this is the kind of thing that will come in handy, um, I don't know, at a speed dating, perhaps. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> so... So I guess I guess part of the thing is, like with the algorithms uh, for for uh, searches on the on, on the internet, whether you're googling stuff or you're looking at say watching videos or you're liking things in your Facebook thing or whatever, the algorithm starts feeding you things that it thinks that you would like also right. that you would also consume, yeah. right? Uh, being able to read somebody's emotional state and knowing the their their likes or their buying patterns on the Amazon or what have you, you can hit them with a comfort product ad or something like this right away. Like all of these things are possible. There is also possible that there's a a good life out there that we could all be living. A good arcs of emotional states and relaxation and things to get us a little bit more energized in sort of longer wavelengths than we are getting from our social media that could potentially actually be applied to all of the technology that we have to make a more fulfilling life. However, could, but you, you're could right. you imagine a smart home that responds to you? So it, it the smart home that knows to dim the lights and put on calming yawn. music, calming yawn. music. It, Ooh, it, it, it gives you out. something like, okay. to energize yeah, you. You're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah. But instead, you're right. You're likely going to be walking past a vending machine that's going to radio scan you and be like, "Hey, buddy, you want some sugar?" You look a little doubt, like whatever. That's how my, yeah. that's, that's, that's how my vending machine sounds. Everybody's sure. vending machine will have its own voice specifically geared to them when they walk by. Yeah. But mine's like, <laughs> mine's like a carny from New Jersey. Hey, buddy. Hey, come over here a sec. Let me talk to you a minute. Sounds like your vending machine used to smell cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did when I was a kid. That's how you got them. Um. Yeah, the research team says they do plan on working with healthcare professionals and social sciences on, on, let me tell you, on public acceptance and ethical concerns around the use of this technology. Oh, not on on ethical applications, though. Yeah, that's what I want to know. What are your concerns? We just want to know how to diffuse your concerns, and then everything will be fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, what is the actual practical use of this? Well, I think there are many practical uses, and we've named several. But uh, I yeah, mean, but those are like capitalistic practical uses. Like, what's the like for the betterment so, of society? Medical, right? So, so if you have, if your house, if your devices, if your house is in tune with you and with it, and through deep learning, has also 
learned your patterns. So if your house determines that you are stressed out, anxious, at a time when you don't really need to be, maybe your house can release calming essential oils and <laughs> dim the lights or maybe if you like you know are yawning at a time when you need to be energized and getting things done maybe your house will automatically make you a cup of coffee i i mean there there are many different ways that a smart home like a truly smart home could respond to you and your needs before you even know you have them you know what I just thought of too is uh, if, if there was something like this in classrooms, it could recognize when everyone was starting to fall asleep and not pay attention. Be like, all right, yes. now it's recess time. Go outside. There was uh, there tell, was a, okay. Teacher, stop, stop. Teacher, stop. The kids yeah. need to go play. Yeah, they're There's not a, listening anymore. They're a movie listening. from like mm-hmm. I don't know when, nineteen eighty ish, called uh, Mass Appeal. Anyway, it had to do with um, uh, the people who were giving sermons, preachers, priests or something, uh, being able to tell, to, to be able to rate it based on the number of coughs that they heard in the, in the, in the, the congregation. The number of coughs that they heard funny. Would, would determine whether or not they needed to alter it or speed it up or make it a little bit more engaging. Because the coughs were the way people subtly disengaged but uh, i was thinking of it less as like i like the smart house idea that's a little like next level okay google uh but i i'm more talking about like haven't therapists been haven't psychologists been working long enough in the field to have figured out the good arc the healthy arc for human Mm -hmm. psychology and can't we just be fed that that healthy human art? The, the smell of dirt and trees? Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Yeah. You know? It's like, hey, uh, you need to go on a dating app, but this is not speed dating. This is, we're really going to take a good look at who these people are and have some conversations over a long period of time to then mm-hmm. realize that uh, it's that person that you meet offline who's going to just, like, knock you out of the... You just didn't see coming. But still... Like, there's got to be a right way of doing things other than everything always being, let's market, let's cl- get them to click, let's get them to engage, and then who cares what the result is? Because that right. doesn't sound like a healthy future. Okay, one, right. one quick problem I see here is that this might uh, remove the ability to feign interest or be polite. <laughs> So I just think this Fake is, this politeness? is opp- yeah. yeah, so this is an opportunity mm-hmm. to like prevent people from being able to lie with their face, which sometimes is a good thing and sometimes would be terrible. Wait, for you think society. it would work like a lie detector? Is it ooh I mean it could No, it, I see that. I see that. Except lie detectors people- don't work. There are like people the who train the themselves to lie to. Yeah, you could train yeah. yourself for situations, you know, get yourself ready for performances in particular situations. Um, I wonder, though, if this could uh, could replace uh, wearables for, you know, so maybe Wearable. you're working out, you're working out at the gym or you're working out um, even in your basement or whatever. And you, instead of having a heart rate monitor on your mm. wrist... You, your 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 house just tells you <laughs> mm-hmm. your heart rate is 156 beats yeah. per minute you haven't gotten up in three hours go walk <laughs> around go walk around i don't want to you, yeah please but maybe get up. yeah maybe there well, is some... i like it it's time to get up time then what does it do up. then it's like don't make me i'm like oh, <laughs> i've taken all the chairs <laughs> Yeah, that's Wait, why did bed. you take the chairs? I don't even. Oh, I can't sit down now. Okay, I see it. <laughs> okay, nicely done. <laughs> and that's when your bed just picks you up and throws you out. <sighs> and on that note, oh my goodness, we've come to the end of our show. We have. We have, and I'm not tracking anyone here, except maybe trying to keep track of our chat room. I do love our chat room. If you watch live, you can always join the chat room. Say hi if you do. 
I'm glad you're back, Justin. Thanks for coming back safely. I'm glad also that we have made it through the official Groundhog Day for 2021, even though every day may seem like Groundhog Day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's special. It was the special day. Six more weeks of winter, everyone. Everywhere. We should be so lucky. <laughs> yeah. All right. Should we talk? Should we talk? Happy, happy end of show things? Mm-hmm. Okay. We've done it. We made it to the end of the show. would like to shout out two people who helped the show. Fada, thank you so much for your help on show notes and on social media. Gord, thank you for keeping that chat room going. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And I would like to thank our Patreon sponsors for their generous support of This Week in Science. Thank you, too. Woody M.S., Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard, Chef Stead, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Cioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Darwin Hand, and Donald Mundus, Mundus Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, do, 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 Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Bentley, The Translator, Big Nell, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian, Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hassenflo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Data Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Melazon, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Rails, Back Flying Out, Richard Porter, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Massaros, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, 2020 can bite my shiny metal R's. Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick, Rick Ramos, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapo, Sarah Chavis, Alex Wilson, John Ratnaswamy, Stu Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Codler, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Gary S., Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, Jason Roberts, and Dave Friedel. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, well, you can do that. You just head yourself over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. Next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time or Thursday, 5 a.m. Central European time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe get some uh, stuff done around the house in your smart home uh, while you listen. Just search for This Week in Science where our podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, please get your friends to subscribe as well. Yeah. Uh, also, if you want any uh, more information on anything you've heard us talk about here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. You can contact us directly, email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into the bottom of a freshwater, frozen, North Arctic Ocean. Arctic Ocean. Arctic Ocean. North Arctic. North Arctic. It's the North Pole. It's, it's kidney-shaped. We talked about it. You can also ping us on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the 
scientific method for all that it's worth and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth cause it's this week in science this week in science this week in science science science, science. this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 science, science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, I, 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 I. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 this week in science. And we have reached the after show. You back there, Blair? Um, hello. <laughs> 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 Uh, we're in the after show. Do, 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 after show. So StreamYard is going to have things like video clips and other things available to play with, which I'm very excited. Mm. They're going to start making templates and other things for broadcasts, which might be very useful. Video elements, because... I'm not good at designing video elements, but other people are. And if they know what sizes to make things. Oh, Sadie. How did Sadie mm -hmm. handle the move? Where is Sadie? She doesn't know we moved. <laughs> She's with my parents. Oh, is she still there? <laughs> yeah. She's having a great time. They have a giant backyard. My dad's been taking her to the beach every day. She's never going to want to come home. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> Uh, no, we're going to get her soon. Um, we're just trying to make sure that, that like furniture is where it's going to be and there's space yeah. for her. We need to get a few more boxes unboxed before there's actually space for a dog. And yeah. she can't accidentally eat something that will kill her. Hey, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, you know, good it, planning. it would have been okay if we didn't have it. But since my parents are more than happy to spend time with her and she loves being there it's it's easy yeah. So, yeah so they're having a ball oh good yes but soon yes hopefully she'll be able to hang out on this couch during twist behind me That's oh my good. gosh i'm just so this is her couch I mean, she's gonna sit back there and she's just gonna be the cutest little thing in the back yeah. hopefully and then, and then we're gonna be like we're just gonna talk about sadie the show is now this week in sadie <laughs> still twist <laughs> You know, it's still twists. It's just this week in Sadie. 
<laughs> yeah. So she'll, she'll come over and be like, what? This is all my stuff, but this isn't my house. <laughs> not my house. Sorry. This is not yeah. my beautiful life. Yeah. Oh, Stella has a dog name. I mean, Pamela Gay has a dog named Stella. I have a cat named Stella. Mm -hmm. Stella. 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 Mm -hmm. Hello, Black Lagoon 2019. Well, we are in our podcast. Black Lagoon 2019 is looking for new peeps to add to a podcast. That sounds fun. What kind of podcast? Hmm. hmm. Got people over on Twitch. Hello, Twitch. How's it going over there? Sounds hmm. like... Uh, yeah. I'm going to sit. It's the after show. I'm going to sit. It is. You can. But now we're just looking at the top of your head. Don't yeah. worry about Where'd it. Where'd you man. go? <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Watch. Just what a second. Happened? It's going to be like... <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> oh, it's like an, an elevator table. There you go. What? Oh, the hunting cool. drone episode. Ooh, I need to get my drone yeah. license or... Drone what? license? License? I have Look a. I have a. Thinking you need a license. I have a Mavic, and I want you, the, and you need the a FCC. For that one? <sighs> yes, the uh, FAA requires a license. I have heard that it is possibly because of the company itself being in China, but I'm not exactly sure what the legal reasons are. But yeah. Anyway. I need to get a I need to get a permit to fly my drone around. But it's a cool drone and I can't wait to fly it. And then we could have an outdoor episode of Twist with the drone <laughs> <laughs> doing live drone footage. That would be uh, an interesting tie-in to Twist, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> It could be, especially if we did something like a camping trip out to John Day Fossil Beds. And oh, can we? Could we? Like after yeah. this whole, yeah. Outdoor camping. I know how we can get there, Talking too. to scientists. Mm -hmm. I like Just it. Please. Mm -hmm. yeah, nice. I want this. That would be fun. Yes. Oh, Kev B, you're right. A smart house would have kept Blair in frame automatically. She wouldn't have had to hit that button. That's I right. still That's just okay. want I still just want a second webcam. I want a reaction cam. I want a cam that I can oh, look yeah. off to the side, like doing the show, and then hit the thing, switch to the camera, and like, or oh, is that really what I think? Right. Oh, oh so I'm messing up my second shot here. Like, I That's want right. that. And Tonight I still don't have that. You could I have that. Is that a you... thing? Is that possible now? Yes. But you would probably want to have software outside of StreamYard that can go into StreamYard as your camera. And then from the other software, you could control which camera input it would be. Uh, see, or... anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, it's, it like, uh, it's too hard. Yeah, it's too hard still. It's a second webcam. You would think would be a, the, just the classic two shot is all I'm asking for. It shouldn't be too much. If you had two computers, you could log in from two computers, each one with a different webcam, and then I and then we could have the the two the two shot. Uh, that's that's it's possible. Not, that's not quite the. <laughs> Anything we could is make possible. it happen. We could make it happen with enough money. Justin says he's Ulysses. That's, that's right. Yes, Thank Ulysses, you. you're right. <laughs> Timid tenor. Somebody noticed your haircut, Justin. Uh, yeah, we, no, I had to go. Very I had to nice travel haircut. Six thousand miles to get it. <laughs> yeah. But I got it. So that's a Denmark haircut. Yes. Yes. Nice. I have a I have a Danish hairstylist uh -huh. uh, who has actually only ever cut my hair. Uh, <laughs> I, but I have to travel 
to them. They don't do house calls. So I had, that was my whole trip. Uh, yes. yes, I, I think I know who this person is. Do I know, have uh, I met this person? I think you might have met this, I I have this met hairstylist. This, <laughs> this hairstylist yeah. slash yeah. scientist slash right before I believe some <laughs> the some world pandemic. shut down. Yeah, the world happened. shut down right, right after we met, met this hairstylist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, actually, it's uh, Need, I don't know it's a I'm great doing... haircut. <laughs> Like, not bad for somebody who had never, ever cut hair before <laughs> and was just faced with uh, somebody who hadn't hair, had a haircut in many months. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I'll try. <laughs> Very brave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Brian went s six months, and now he's almost at six, mo six months again. <laughs> pretty, it's it's pretty so you just got to figure it out like go watch a couple of youtube videos and uh get some clippers i don't and... think you'd let me do that <laughs> we've talked about it yeah you actually you both have to be brave uh, together to, i mean to i do it work. i've done it i've cut other people's hair before but are you talking I've, about like women's hair where it's long and you're just like, well, just take a little off? I've or are you talking both. about. I've used clippers on a guy before. Okay. But um, not a long time. I, I would want to watch a YouTube video first. Yeah, no good for me. I've, 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 I, I try to cut hair occasionally. Mm -hmm. It goes okay. I haven't done any lasting damage. <laughs> It's good. <laughs> I just well, can't show you yeah. the back. Because that's... Gorov hasn't... <laughs> you haven't cut your hair this entire pandemic. Nice. Oh. That's got to be some yeah, hair. Yeah, you have a ponytail? I know. Marshall hasn't... He's gotten hair cuts, but he's growing his hair out. I told him I liked Kurt Russell as Santa Claus, and so he took that as... <laughs> Good. He took that as a goal. So, wait, so he has the full, he has facial hair? He, has he facial does hair? not at oh. all. <laughs> but he's hes trying to grow the hair out. Oh, okay. All right, all right. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Yeah. And I do know I have, oh, Garav can make a ponytail now. Nice. Yeah, I have other friends who are growing their hair as well, can do the ponytail. Pandemic um, ponytails. I we started watching Last Man on maybe. Earth awesome. again because it's yeah. very appropriate and yes. uh, yeah it's very interesting to watch Will Forte's hair grow. <laughs> <laughs> do yeah. they do that in the in the show? Just let it yes. let it grow. Oh, yeah. that's good. Yeah, and he has a beard that like goes straight out on the sides. Oh my gosh! Yeah, love it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it makes sense. If you really were the last man on earth, why would you shave? I would still want to okay. shave. I don't think I, I, I it has nothing to do Life with other do people. With yeah, but what me. about like after two years of being alone? If I could still get a uh, usable shaver or a working shaver, yeah, I would do it. Absolutely. That's the one thing I would, this, this, I would not get a haircut probably. This would be down to my arse, but uh, I'd still be clean shaven. Mm -hmm. Don't I don't like the, the, the it just doesn't the feel of yeah. it. It's just so. What are your uh, Super Bowl party plans? There's the Super Bowl's happening. <laughs> party? What's a party? Are they are they really <laughs> do? Are they going through with it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're oh, having a Super Bowl. Yes, there's going to be a game. There have been games. They've got a. They've right. got a. I think they've got bubbles for the various but teams. They've the NFL bubble transmission is pretty bad, isn't it? Hmm. Yes. Yeah. They uh, keep pe people yeah. keep having to not be in going in quarantine and all sorts of stuff yeah didn't you know, one it has... end up that with their like second string kicker being quarterback they ran out of players or something that's just because everybody was hurt that it was some of it was covid uh, yeah, no, 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 two of them i yeah. think two of them one was an injury but i think two 
of the backups were COVID. Yeah. I think you're right. And there was there was also talk about they were they were like trying to see if they could get like the quarterback coach to go in, but the yeah. NFL told them no, no because they didn't want teams stacking their coaching staff with uh, actual players to try to get around the whole like cash limits on how many or limits on how many players you could have on the team and all this stuff. Um. But yeah, I think I think it's a great testament to professional sports that they've managed yeah. to uh, to keep themselves separate from society for this year. To such yeah, an they they say they've had a league positivity rate of from testing of 008 percent, which is now, pretty can good. I, can I also point something out? They've been testing. Yes, <laughs> everyone. Everyone With all the time. With great regularity. Um, yeah. That's kind of a good model. We should maybe, as a greater nation, look towards. Again, uh, this is this is like this is that argument that I lost immediately after floating it. That professional athletes should be in that early tier uh, of people who get vaccinated, but they. They do provide us, they're like the Na- what NASA does for all sorts of different technologies by doing the moonshot and whatever. The, the professional athletes do for medicine. They really do. They really what's do. Really, what's interesting here, though, so Eric in Alaska is saying a lot of the advertisers are dropping out of the Super Bowl this year, so there are fewer fun ads. And I Wait, think that's what? going to, yeah, because there's not going to be... Is the ability As, to make good ads? Is that why? No, they can still... Because there's going to be still, eyes on it. Nobody is leaving the house. So, so Budweiser, what a few brands are doing, like they that have multiple sub-brands underneath them, they're taking their main brand and that money that's spent on ads out. So Budweiser is taking all of the money they would have spent on a Super Bowl Budweiser Horses ad. kicking a football or right, beer bottles. Right, that kind of stuff, going, exactly. Guess, they're ta- they're they're taking that money and they are uh funding covid uh messaging so Uh they're going to they're going to put the money towards ads that support uh people wearing masks and social distancing and so public health messages um and there are other brands that are doing the same thing but even though budweiser is skipping the super bowl their sub brands so like bud light and and other brands that are within their their tent are are still going to be making Super Bowl ads. So there will be yeah, so there will be ads. It's mm-hmm. yeah. We just might not have the same players that you normally see, the normal big name brands. I think Coca Cola might be out and doing something else. Hmm. Yeah. There were or or it's Pepsi or something. There was like a few and one Doritos and maybe I don't know. I I read an article about it, but it was really interesting that um, there was there was this push to take the ad money and donate it to the ad council and COVID messaging, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm okay with not having as fun of ads for the Super Bowl, but because I think the ad council needs that money. <laughs> Let's get the message out, people. Oh, the puppy bowl. That would be good. Is that still going on? I mean, one would assume. I don't know. It that seems a... like a pretty COVID safe activity. Wait, what's <laughs> that? Is that the, is that a, uh, no, no, it's not Jimmy mm. Kimmel. It's the other. It's, it's Animal Planet does the puppy bowl. Is it Animal Planet? Oh, okay. yes. So and so it's all animals. It's all puppies that are actually up for adoption. Oh. And uh, yeah, and so they all go and they just play around on a little. Uh, yes, field. there will be a puppy bowl. There will I be Sunday, February seventh at two p.m. Eastern time, ahead of the Super Bowl. Oh, they're not going concurrent this year, huh? No, it's going to be ahead of the Super Bowl, which is the Buccaneers versus the Chiefs, kicking off. At 3.30 uh, Pacific time. JG says, uh, they're good on COVID, but not so good on traumatic brain injury. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, well, actually, <laughs> yeah, though, we, on it. 
No, but we, like, as a society, as a scientific, if you're going to research concussions or traumatic brain injury, this is this is a place you can pull tremendous data and research from. This is, again, this is one of those weird things where I don't know that, I, I, I feel like we talked about this, like, so many times that it seems like, uh, you know, it's old news, but... Every kind of sports injury happens to people in their day-to-day lives at some point. Uh, ACL tears, things like this, knee tears. These You tear this small muscle around your knee that keeps the kneecap in place. These sorts of things used to be like, okay, we'll give you a cane. That's it. You now walk with a limp forever. Try not to use your leg or put weight on it. But, but because you had like somebody who over the years you had thousands of athletes who had great potential for their teams and had money invested in them already and got the best possible treatment but also they spent money on research to see how they could fix injuries like this if you tear your your meniscus or your acl or something like this Mm. it's not a big deal now they know exactly what to do they know exactly how to treat it and you will be walking around just fine but the difference is that if you tear a ligament in your leg, your personality doesn't change and you don't become suicidal. <laughs> it's this is like a very different those are two very different points. And I understand Whoa, that like, whoa, what are you talking about? Traumatic talking brain about... injuries. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so, yes, yes. So I think that's but... a that's a pretty big jump to go from It isn't like... it isn't because I'm not I'm not making a some moralistic issue about the thing. What I'm saying is The other side is, if we're also learning what we learn about knee tears when it comes to traumatic brain injury and how to heal the brain and how to get that, then we're also like, this is again, this is, you're putting people into traumatic situations for completely different reasons, but we're learning tremendous amounts on how we can treat even Brain injuries, even right. concussions. Sports, even... The sports medicine for for these I'm professional not to sports. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, the professional sports are leading to better understanding and and how to treat things because mm-hmm. these are the first the like like veterans. Um, they they're the except, front they're in the front lines for needing yeah. treatment. Yeah, except veterans typically don't have as much money per, behind each veteran. Or a good enough lobbying or union or whatever you want to call it behind getting them back into society. They really don't. A lot of the times, like, veteran hospitals are rather underfunded compared oh, to yeah. any Absolutely. kind of other health care you can imagine. Um, but they will, but you are get these professional athletes, who many of whom are millionaires, if not multimillionaires, when they go to seek treatment for right, something, disease. they can call up the best experts, the best researchers, and they can get funding behind that research through the union to take care of those things. One I, of the I will that- say, if I can just throw out there as a, as a devil's advocate thing here, is mm-hmm. that that is true for the people who are professional athletes. But there is a pipeline of people who are trying to become professional athlete, athletes who get terrible Very injuries injured. Yeah. and never make it to be professionals and don't get the same medical care so the no, pipeline so, is part of the problem here no it's so so what i'm talking don't about just is something say no <laughs> oh, no i will say more words i'll say more words i'll say well i think i think that what we're talking about is slightly different um when i'm talking about them getting the best treatment and therefore because they're rich they'll be fine isn't what i mean what i mean is because of the wealth that it pioneered these treatments and it pioneered this research. And so now that kid who was playing uh, 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 high school football who gets a knee injury now doesn't walk with a limp for the rest of their life talking about, oh, yeah, the limp came from a high school football game back in 86 when, no, no, now they got it. (laughs) The surgeon knew how to fix it. They knew how to do the the uh, physical therapy afterwards, and now that kid walks like you never. Or now that adult or that old man can walk like he never had a knee injury. 
That's what I meant. I don't. I. I I'm not trying to say and that. Hopefully, they Hopefully, and hopefully this, that the, money. I take it back to take it back to the traumatic brain injury. Hopefully that money will spearhead a lot of treatments for not just football players, but people who are in car accidents and exactly. um, you know who are massively impacted by exactly. impacts to their to their heads to their brains. I mean, and, it's and a largely, huge problem. It's, the, it's largely, I think, the players union. Like they have, they have research that they invest in, the, it's separate from the NFL, but they get the NFL to kick into, yeah, um, it, into all of these things, and and yeah, you if you get into a car accident, and you get a traumatic head injury, who's gonna pay for a two million dollar project into seeing or a three million dollars worth of investment into seeing how to keep that from from affecting the rest of your life? You would think maybe the insurance companies would do it. You'd think maybe the government would. Nobody's doing it. Nah. Yeah. So, so there's an it's urgency <laughs> that's created by the union and the relationship with the money that's involved. That does. Pro- so, yes, you're right. There's the fact. That I think that's it's the most horrendous thing about that pipeline that you're talking about. Is the kid from the high school made it through injury free through high school. He got a four year college scholarship to go play football, and he's going to get a college education, and he's going to become. Uh, science communicator because that's really what he wants to do more than football but in that first year he gets a leg injury and won't be able to play for maybe at least another year and he gets kicked off the team and loses the scholarship so he can't go to the college anymore that i think you need a guaranteed scholarship i don't think it should be play dependent or injury dependent because that part is horrendously wrong and unfair you're playing you're playing and putting your health up on the line as that's the thing that you're you're collateral your collateral is your future health so yeah yeah, give them an education give it why not yes but they throw those kids out of out of out of college which is no they do it's it's i think the most vile uh American educational yeah. system, the university system included, there needs mm-hmm. to be overhaul. We're seeing a lot of that stuff starting to change. Yeah. And the pandemic is pushing a lot of change um, at the moment. We'll see We'll see what kind of upheaval there is. I don't know. Hopefully we'll get university, at least college level education for everyone. Because, I mean, it basically is what a high school education used to be. Mm-hmm. Right. Used to be, oh, you got a high school diploma. Great. You can get a job. Now it's like, what? You don't have a college diploma? What? Yeah. Well, and uh, harder. It college makes it hard. at that point when it was optional was like $125 a semester. And now oh. it's pretty much required. And the cheapest schools are thousands of dollars a semester. Yeah, we're in so, debt forever, and everybody feels like they have to do great. it, so they put themselves into debt, and then they're the predatory colleges. Blah, the whole system. Blah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know what there is? is playing at the same time as the puppy bowl? What? The kitten bowl. They usually do a halftime show with kittens. <laughs> they're going to do... At 2 p.m. Eastern Time, yeah, yeah. the Kitten Bowl on the oh Hallmark Channel. Welcome to being woke, oh. Blair. They're not just the entertainment at halftime. They're athletes, too. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, that's interesting. That's, but, you know, I, I think there's, like, this bias, this puppy bias. There is obviously so much more money in the puppy bowl. Like, what is this? This is, like men's football and women's football we're gonna fund the puppies but we're not gonna fund the kittens i mean come on this is ridiculous Mm -hmm. they all need to be adopted truth (laughs) oh my god sony mentioned robin hood the robin hood fiasco that the uh, oh, GameStop know. thing GameStop. that happened last week. That was my favorite story. That was so I woke brilliant. up I woke up one morning and everybody was talking about GameStop and I was like, okay. Why? <laughs> what is going on? I did a deep dive and I was like, what is happening here? Yeah. So yeah. Suddenly a lot of people learned about stonks. Who didn't yeah. know about stonks. <laughs> yeah. It's yikes. Anyway. Suddenly I think people... it's very funny that that uh when you when you beat somebody at their own game, you're cheating. It's very like it's very school, like schoolyard logic. 
like oh, you know, that's only allowed when I do it. Yeah, yeah no, because there's a group of people on a Reddit sub channel got this idea started. That's some sort of like collusion-y thing. But when we go on one of the eight or all of the eight uh, financial channels on the cable news networks and say, yeah, I think we're going to, we're going to short this one because we don't like the future of it and everybody else should sell it. That's, that's, not, that's, that's, that's fine. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, and, oh, sure. That hedge fund, they can totally overshort the stock. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. And by the way, don't mess with nerd sold. stocks. Don't mess, don't short nerd stocks. Don't. Do the not nerd short stops. the game stops. The nerds the will world. get you. The nerds will come and take. <laughs> See, this is the power of the internet too. Is like pre-internet. Nerds. This never. Good to know nerds are st- nerds have a place in there. <laughs> it's the internet has allowed this to happen. Like oh, absolutely, yeah. It's, because even if you had a way to get in touch with people about this thing, enough time would have passed that games. GameStop would have already been dead by the time this all got figured out. But because you have this way to just be like, this is what's happening. This is what we're going to do. Let's do it right now. And you can have this back and forth and make a plan and boom. It was, yeah, it was definitely like, oh, the internet has given us uh, the ability to peek kind of behind the veil of certain things in our society in a way that we haven't before. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, and and not just peek behind the veil. I think shine light mm-hmm. on the dark corners where um, certain certain groups of people have been taking advantage of the financial so, system so for years this... and taking and transferring money to the wealthy yeah. for years. There was you know, a, so it's very interesting. Uh, an example of this about two years ago uh, with GE uh, General Electric. Uh, there was a very public, uh, saying that this just, GE is in trouble. They're going to go bankrupt, blah, 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 blah. It, and it went out through those financial channels. The tank, the stock tanked. Turned out that, uh, person was linked to a group that was shorting, uh, making the bet that they would fail. So like, this has been that game going on for a long time. Yeah. With all of the loudspeaker in the media, but it's and everything. not insider trading. But these guys had no media. They weren't. They were just like, yeah. "We're gonna buy it. We're gonna. It's shorted. We'll buy it. That's mm-hmm. it." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nerds. Go people. Go, Go smart nerd people. people. Go, Go nerd, nerd people. people. Go people who are. I don't know, still angry that the banks weren't punished for the for the mm-hmm. recession. Well, and that stocks are doing so well during a pandemic when our economy is like doing terribly and this is exactly That's why. It's it's why and it's it's because our economy is not the stock market. Yeah. It's not. No. And this trickle down thing, it's not working. Mm mm. None of the evidence whoa, suggests whoa, it's now, working. Now, now, I, I, do, I bet now, you disagree. Now, 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 let me tell you. Let me tell you. Uh, I do believe uh, the many billions of dollars lost by the hedge funds uh, to these GameStop investors will oh, eventually, that, eventually that's a nice trickle, trickle down mm-hmm. to them. Will mm-hmm. eventually trickle. Because they're all out of work and they're broke and they're not going to get jobs again because they just, they, yeah. they basically face planted with a multi-billion dollar uh, treasury behind them but but eventually those nerds will spend the money and it'll trickle oh. down to you just sure, just sure. wait just it'll just wait. take some time but just wait You'll, the money will come back in the direction of that company again someday maybe sure <laughs> yeah, sure it will jeez <laughs> Thunder Beaver know. says this country practices evaporate up economics. It does. Definitely yes. True. I was going to say trickle up, but I like the evaporate up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our water cycle going. <sighs> yes. Uh, Seriously, the stock market is, it's like gambling. It, it is, mm-hmm. it's, it's legal gambling. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And that's why the this... redditors are getting in trouble oh. now is because they call it gambling. So they're like, oh no, 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 no. Stockbrokers and hedge funds, they're not gambling though. They're like 
it's their job. So that's Ooh. allowed when they do that. But because you Redditors, you're gambling. But what if my job was as a bookie? <laughs> right, no. Right. It's my job. I read, uh, Cory Doctorow had this really interesting thread um, kind of going through the history of the stock market and 401ks and um, how people... How how people got duped into um, setting their their savings, their retirement up for gambling and kind of <laughs> paying into this system when it, it didn't start out this way. This is something that happened during the eighties and it's seventies uh, and eighties, but it's a it's it was a fast and fascinating thread um, of how financial pressures kind of twisted things to where they are today and yeah it's a it's we are we are in a sticky little wicket that's for mm -hmm. sure yeah it's for sure mm -hmm. i heard you say something justin is it that time is it is that what you were gonna say blair? is it yeah. time to say good night it's blair? time to say good night blair is it time to say good night justin it's time to say good night, Justin. All Is right. it time to say good night, Dr. Night, Kiki? Kiki. <laughs> it is. Good night, everyone. We will see you again next week. We do hope that you have a wonderful week. Don't go to any Super Bowl parties, please. No. No. Just stay home with your multiple screens and watch the puppy bowl, the kitten bowl, the stonk market and the super bowl on all the screens or don't and just watch old episodes of this week in science on yeah. YouTube. I mean, that'd what be I fine do. too. That's yeah, that's I what do. you could do. Science everyone, it's science. We'll see you next week. Thank you for spending time with us. We hope that you stay well. <laughs>